Hello and welcome. This session is sponsored by Fortinet. Fortinet's mission is to deliver the most innovative, highest performing network security fa fabric to secure and simplify your IT infrastructure. We are a leading global provider of network security and SD1, switching and wireless access, network access, control, authentication, public and private cloud security, and point security in AI-driven advanced threat protection solutions for carriers, data centers, enterprises, and distributed offices. Thank you for coming and enjoy the session. Let me unmute myself. <clears throat> so good afternoon, everybody. I really honestly feel like I'm talking to myself because nobody has their camera on. And I'm such an extrovert that I would love to see you all. So if someone, at least two or three people could turn their cameras on so I can feel like I'm actually talking to somebody, I would love it. But if not, thank you, Darren. Thank you, Tammy. Oh, hey, Tammy. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Linda. Oh, I feel so good now. Yes, yes, thank y'all. <laughs> Oh, and if more want to do it, thank you. Thank you, Thomas. This is awesome. Um, so I'm not going to sit here and talk the whole time because this is a roundtable discussion and um, we have almost 30 people in here. And so we're going to um, have discussions um, about teaching tech to tech and we may go off on a few other tantrums, but um, thank you, AJ. Um, but um, we're just going to talk about our experiences right now and, and um, how we're getting through um, to our people um, now that a lot of people are remote. And I do realize that a lot of agencies did not go remote. Some people are still in the office, but we're going to talk about all of that too. So again, welcome to our session. So the first thing I wanted to find out is from all whoever wants to speak. Um, I wanted to find out like, what is your role um, as far as um, um, when I say teaching tech to tech to um, non techs, um, what is your role in in the department as in are you the director are you the tech person or are you the department trainer. Um, let me know what your role is and how um, you have been involved with um, turning people into turning the organization into a remote organization so whoever wants to start first, um, please, um, please talk. I guess I can go first. Okay. <laughs> I'm uh, one of the two help desk folks at my uh, city of Greenville. Um, Colin's also in this call too, I think. So I won't speak for both of us, I don't think, but we kind of mirror each other a good bit. Um, I've got a background in technical writing. So I've been working a lot with all of our server admins and service software folks to write the training material, um, both as given either in hard copy or like PDF but also working with Colin um, to determine how best to phrase things. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but that translation layer, I guess, between the rest of the IT department and the rest of the city. <laughs> yeah, because a, a lot of times, I'm, I'm probably going to get off on a little tangent here, but a lot of times we have to be considerate of the fact that um, our users don't know what a sonic wall is. They don't know, who, you know, they don't know what, um, a lot of the terminology, because I was reading an email that um, somebody sent to a non-tech person the other day, and I was like, they don't know what you just said. Like, that's just Greek, you know? <laughs> and um, then sometimes we get frustrated because they don't understand. But like I tell people all the time, a lot of times our, um, we're city and county. You know, somebody went to school to, to be a police officer or they went to school to learn nursing or they went to school to learn um, Department of Social Services stuff. They don't know tech stuff. So we have to be considerate of that. So that's very important with your technical writing too, right? <laughs> It's, it's really important to, to, and again, it's kind of a, you almost have to either know your audience before you talk to them, or you have to bring it as far down as you can, because I can't just say, click on the net motion icon in your system tray. I need to say, there's a big M in the bottom right corner of the screen. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly, AJ. That is so completely accurate about net motion. <laughs> Spot on. Well, and it's, you know, it's, 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 it can be even more, you know, more. I guess more 
simple than that because I remember um, at another job I had, I had a user that I had to talk through um, connecting, just connecting to the internet. And I, I told him to open up his web browser and he didn't know what that was. And I told him to inter open up Internet Explorer and he, he didn't know what that was. And I told him to click on the big blue E. And he that, knew what that was. That he knew That's what that gotten was. harder because now there's two big blue E's. Right, right. <laughs> it's the E with the gold halo, not the other E. <laughs> well, that, this was before Edge. Yes. Now. <laughs> so I, I'd agree with AJ. Um, and so uh, I do tech support, but I actually do some technical writing and sort of jack of all trades. And I remind people when they start going, well, I'm not really good at tech and all those things. And I remind them, I'm not good at your job. All right. I don't expect right. you to be good at yeah. my job. That's what I'm there for. My job is to help you do your job. I can't step in and do what you do. And I think a lot of times just hearing those words, I can hear it that de-escalation where they don't feel like I'm judging them. Oh right. yeah, EJ's over there clapping. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm, I'm actually traveling too. So I, there's no clapping on my side. Um, but, but you can feel that. Now, having said that, there are some of those humans that I work with that um, I have a very large bottle of Tylenol that sits next to my <laughs> office. And there's also a spot that the maintenance people have to clean frequently because it sort of gets kind of icky from where I put my head down. Um, <laughs> but they don't see me normally. I don't, I don't actually do this with them very often. But if I do, I have to be happy hunky-dory and they have no idea how really shitty my day has been. And the fact that you're the 15th person who's called and can't figure out which E to click, okay? They don't know that, all right? Um, and that's from my perspective in writing and doing those types of things. You know, you're just sitting there thinking, if it was my car, I would never figure out, like if my mechanic was trying to walk me through something with my car. And so I put myself in that situation because they're not trying to be quote unquote stupid. It's just, they don't do what we do. Right, right. And they're, they're stepping into all new technology. I don't know about you guys, but I very quickly in about the span of a week learned about eight different video conferencing solutions, plus, you know, voice over IP, plus this, that, the other thing. How am I supposed to expect somebody else who does not do what I do to be able to learn it that quickly? Right. And I got to be able to turn it around on a dime. Um, that or say, can you hold on a second and then magically go to Google and see if I can't find the solution really quick. Okay. Um, and that does happen. And, and I think most of our users, um, I right now support 180 people um, between two and a half people. And most of them, when they call, even if they're in a panic state, they get the fact that I'm there to help them. They've got to take a breath um, and that we will help them. But it might take us just a little bit longer because we're still learning this too. All right. Um, I've got people who are in Microsoft Teams. So for those of you who have not used Microsoft Teams, be very thankful. All right. Because if you thought Zoom or, you know, any of the other ones sucked, be thankful you're not running Zoom or running Teams also. I'm not a fan of Teams either. <laughs> it's growing on me. Um, I would I would go back to something that Bethann said of there's always going to be that that person that doesn't get it. Um, and you kind of have to factor that into your tech teaching as well, I would say. You don't need to take your language and work so hard to bring it down to that one person because they're going to call regardless. No matter what you send them, they're going to call and ask for help. So you don't have to put quite that much effort. And you can have a little bit of tech. Most folks at least in our environment, know what Internet Explorer is. So I can take that shortcut and say, open this up in Internet Explorer. And then five people will call and go, I don't know what to do, or this isn't working. And you look in there on Chrome and then, well, that's why. Um, so, it, but they're the same people that are going to call regardless what, what your answer is going to be. So, yeah, I, so I, I, of it's finding that balance to me of um, finding the right language, but not spending all day refining it to the point that no one's going to call because you'll never get there. Yeah, I, we run for 80%. That's actually what we look for. And we also look for um, newspapers right for about an eighth grade um, education level. And so that's what I shoot for 
is not stupidity, not anything like that, but it's easy language. Okay. It, it's not overly complex, but it is. I do a ton of pictures and I get people who go, wow, that's really easy for me to figure out because they don't read it ever. They only look for the picture. So if you put the big E there, that's the E they're looking for versus trying to explain this is the one that's edge, but that's not really the one you want because this is how it looks. I just say, this is the one to go to. Double click on it, moving on. And I think most of our users get that. Um, and now that they've gotten kind of used to in the last year, the way I do documentation, that's the way they now prefer it. Um, versus getting this three-page document that's just text after text after text. Right, right, yeah. right. I'm a big, I'm a big believer in screenshots and and images and uh, yeah, I'm a I'm a writer as a hobby, um, but you know I think that the the power of images for writing help documents is uh, it's just yeah you don't want to send your users a wall of text. And including the snipping tool these days in Windows, such a godsend. Uh, TechSmith, the, the same guys that make Camtasia, make this wonderful little screen capture tool called Snagit. It has stamps yep. in it that lets you do steps and arrows and click here, and this is what your cursor should look like. Um, it's, it's rather inexpensive, but invaluable for what it does. I got better at doing directions as well when we went down for ransomware because I was the only help desk person at the time and I had to write the steps for our applications team to follow to install certain software. Mm. And I took a few things for granted that they would understand just certain steps that and even the IT people. Yeah, I like, want to add that in there real quick. Our applications team is part of the IT department that he's talking about. So even within IT, <laughs> We've got to make sure we mitigate the language correctly. Sorry, go ahead. Because I skipped, I skipped like, you know, turn the computer on and log in. And I did those steps on the first computer. Like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm turning the computer on. Well, that wasn't written down. Yeah. My okay. favorite is, is is when, especially from an IT perspective, that the person you're doing an install, and all it says is click next three times. What the hell? If something changes in the middle, I don't know what I click next to. And oh, I, I, yeah. And that's from an IT perspective. I don't do applications all the time, but I'm just like, no, back up the train, buddy. I want screenshots for this because I want to know what I click next on. Because if there's an error and I have to go backwards, I'd like to know which error it was and what screen. Because when I call help desk, Colin, okay, I want to be able to tell them what step it was. That you got laughing, but I'm telling you, man. Even for ourselves, it's, we do great for, for sending stuff to our users. We suck when it comes to doing stuff for ourselves because we shortcut all the time and assume everybody else knows exactly what we're talking about. Or so we've our, done it so many times that you just, it's just, you know, autopilot. Well, see, now you know that. Actual, like, <laughs> I've started doing actual like YouTube type training videos for a lot of people. Nice. Where it's me, you know, doing the screencastify or whatever it is, and snag it through the whole peep, and then, you know, even for IT staff that need to do this other task, uh, I've done training for that as well. So I've, that's definitely helped kind of move things along. Snagit's also really good for that because with Snagit you can do not just screen capture but video capture. What do you guys use for, and, and we, you know, everybody uses iP uh, iPad crap, that's fine. But what are you using for phones? Um, because I have to hodgepodge the stuff together if I'm trying to teach somebody how to, how to do very specific things on a phone. What We're iPhone what only. Oh, uh, well, the, we, we run a yeah, gamut. So what do you the have? Only thing, the only thing we issue um, as far as a smartphone are iPhones because I found that they are basically the Fisher price of telephones. <laughs> um, even from update to update, they're consistent. You know, iPads look like iPhones. It's, it's just a, a consistency of UI and, and easy to use. I absolutely hate Mac for use in our computing environment, and we will not use them ever as long as I'm director, but um, iPhones, I'm happy with those. We only run Android 
um, actual phones, but we do have iPads, absolutely no Macs, because I completely agree with you. Because that requires someone who has a very, very specific skill set. And that is not something most people want to put on their, you know, within their own department. But from an Android standpoint, what's everybody else using? Anything? If we are using to do any, I would probably use like a, a, some sort of an emulator and just screen cap through the emulator. Okay. I haven't had to thus far. I had to show somebody how to use Zoom so I could actually see what was on their screen and had never done it through Zoom on a mobile device on a phone and was literally doing it like in my head because I had nothing else to use at the time while I was driving. So I was kind of hopeful somebody would have something magic for me. Okay. I know it, I'm not the only person who diagnoses stuff when they're on the road. Okay. No, nope. I was still I wasn't looking at anything. I was still driving. It was just all in my head. For the, for those of you using Beyond Trust, Bomgar, they do have uh, apps that let you see your users' phone screens. Um, oh. Certain Android devices, you can control them. iPhone, you can only see the screen, but even seeing what they're looking at can be invaluable. I know uh, Joseph's in the session. Um, he's used it with a couple of our users before. You can speak to that experience. Um, I didn't get to use it that much, but uh, at least it works. I'll, I'll say that much to it right now. I'll have to actually do a little more messing around with it. So we've talked a lot about um, uh, our users and their experience and um, how we're supporting them. So tell me about your experience with supporting users who are, um, when they have issues when they're actually at home like um do you all have any issues with supporting um, the users from home we're kind of lucky because most of our teleworkers um that are working from home are remoting back into their computers so oh okay once okay. the computer that on the site we just use you know we're we're using sccm so we can remote into their city computer and help them there it has been challenging to say the least mm -hmm. um setting up either the Citrix connection back in, or we're also using the Checkpoint VPN with a, a two-factor authentication there just to get the connection back into the city. I think tangent off of that, the biggest difficulty we've had with that setup has not been so much the training. It's things that you wouldn't expect to be a problem like password changes uh, because they hit control at delete and the sessions on their home system <laughs> and the change password yeah. didn't work for some reason. <laughs> well, you just change your password on your home computer. Um, or if they miss the password expiration and yeah. then both Citrix or the Checkpoint VPN, you can't change it through there. Right, right. So I said the reason a, can't, reason can't a free tool by NetRix, N-E-T-W-R-I-X, um, to send automatic email notifications 14 days ahead for password expirations. Oh, we do that. Uh, they get ignored, 10, 10, but at least we're sending them. Yeah, ours go 14, 10, 7, 5, 3, 2, 1, I think. Hmm. Something along those lines. That's yep. awesome. We upgraded to Windows 10 and our VPN users don't get any notice at all. And then I start getting magic phone calls. Um, and because I can't see an active directory, when the last time they changed because my access got dropped when I changed departments and the reports that I normally get aren't functioning right now, we ended up having to send massive, and I told you I do 180 people, we sent massive emails that all got flagged as phishing. Um, so we had a great time. AJ, can I come work with you guys, please? Um, seriously? You're not gonna get away from that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I will say, though, the, the first question, uh, we do VPN, and so we use Windows Assistance to get in. So that's pretty easy for us. Okay. The biggest question, though, is um, our users do not all live in areas that have consistent um, internet. And so my number one question to people when they call and say they're having problems with specific applications is, do you have an Xbox at your house? And about 50% of the time, the answer is yes. And I go, is it currently running? Yes. Go tell your children to turn it off and magically your stuff will start working again. You get in, 
Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. And so that's that's one of those conversations I've had to work with our users on in a very nice way. I mean, you guys can hear this and obviously know that I'm kind of being obnoxious, but I have to be really nice <laughs> about this. But we do tell our users, we said between the between the hours of eight and three, you will see, you know, degradation in your area because there are kids um, and the Internet is currently being throttled. So even I have kick butt internet at my house and I'm telling you at 2.30 in the afternoon, I can tell kids are getting online for gaming. Um, not for school, it's never for school. It's always gaming because our stuff just starts slowing down. I, you're, you're bringing up a point that I was gonna go to next. Uh, and I wish Steve Randone was here. He actually started um, delving into this in another session. I said, please stay for my session. Um, but one of the things he was talking about was he's in a beach town. And he was saying that because he's in a beach town, a lot of people came on vacation and stayed. Um, so they're there, they're using up the bandwidth and everything is running slow. And um, he was having, I wish he was here um, to talk about that. Anybody else having um, those issues, beach towns or mountain towns or whatever? AJ shaking his head, yes. Speak to it, we're, AJ. We're, <laughs> okay. we're not even a beach town. Not a beach town, we don't have that problem. We're just rural <laughs> Carolina with the college. <laughs> ah, with the college, yeah. That makes a difference too. But <laughs> They were very good when they set up our teleworking stuff. Um, IT, city managers, and HR were like, it is a privilege, not a right. So there were certain things. If you can't do your job remotely, then you have to come into the office. Yeah, I will agree so, with Colin. That was what we did at Orange County. Um, and it really cut down on the number of people calling us and complaining and wanting me to diagnose what was wrong with their router. Let me put it this way. I don't even do that at my own house. That is what my spouse is for. There is no <laughs> chance in hell I can do it at your house remote. I know you're all laughing, but it's true. I can. I have my own specialties. I can use Excel. He can't. He takes care of my router. Okay. But but being able to say that and having management back us up and say, hey, if you can't do it, it our IT people are not responsible for making this work. All right, we're responsible for your equipment. Once it's in the house, you're connected back to us. If there's an issue, not a problem. But if you can't connect back to us, we're not dealing with it. Uh, and so being able to say it, we'd have about five people that, you know, that and the county should be paying for my stuff. And I went, really? Wow, because they're not paying for my stuff. So um, that's a pretty big expense if you're expecting a county to pick up that kind of stuff. Right, right. Those are the types of things I wanted to know. How, that, that, thank you, um, Beth Ann, for, um, for addressing that. And we were talking about uh, the issue of connectivity in a session earlier today mm -hmm. um, because West, you know, I, I'm from Winston-Salem mm -hmm. and everybody in town has fine, the internet's, you know, it's spectrum, but it's, it's decent. Um, but if you get much further west of here, um, you start to run into issues. And I was curious, we didn't get any real answers in that, in that uh, round table, but I was curious because AJ asked the same question, you know, what are people doing? Um, and yeah, it's fine to say, well, you know, if you can't do your job from home because you don't have internet, then you got to come into the office, but then you're exposing people to a very real potential physical danger. Um, what are the options that anybody's using? I know some people use jetpacks, but if you don't have a good uh, cellular data connectivity, which is, I've been to Eastern North Carolina, I have family there and I went to college there, data sucks in Eastern North Carolina. Yes, you know, it does. What do you do? And there's, there's an interesting tangent off of that that's not exactly related to us, but kind of is. Um, and that is that there are, at least in, in Greenville, a lot of families, not of employees, but families with kids that have, you know, school laptops and they're trying to do homework. And they're calling up the city trying to figure out, you know, where does the city have free Wi-Fi available so they can park their car for a couple hours. So it's 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 really interesting um watching the need for internet increase dramatically without increase of service going up dramatically. 
it, 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 it'll be interesting to see what comes of this over the next couple of years. Right. And I mean, you would I'm think done. you would think with um, with the county, with Pitt County, you would think there being a, a large hospital and, you know, the university there, there would be a better a better internet infrastructure in place than there is. There's there's in the city limits there are good options and near city buildings there are public Wi-Fi accessible but I don't know if Pitt County does that or not I know that you don't get well maybe at Viden specifically you do ECU doesn't have a particularly robust public Wi-Fi so it's it, it I don't know <laughs> observation I guess we we used to live out in Green County and I couldn't imagine living in Greene County right now and having to work from home. Um, so yeah, it's just, uh, there's a definite need for internet connectivity in the rural parts of our state. And I don't know what the answer is, but that's definitely something that our government, you know, state, local government need to come up with solutions for, especially for things like this, but even just for regular life, it's it's a real need. It's not just a, a, a nice thing to have. It's, it's definitely becoming um, a utility like any other. I would say that specifically staff-based, I found myself just trying all the different ISPs with their jab packs, be it AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, who, who got me the coverage for one particular person that I needed and you end up kind of branching out, but you know, ultimately you can get some connectivity for certain people. It's definitely not gonna cover everybody, but definitely from a staff base, some of that helps. And then most of the providers are willing to give you a phone, give you a you know, tablet, a, a jetpack, whatever it is to try out in these different areas. We're looking at uh, AT&T FirstNet right now to see about a changeover from Verizon and if it's going to be useful. So they've sent us all kinds of phones and jet packs to try out. And that's definitely been helpful for us. We've, we've recently trialed uh, AT&T's first net. Uh, they sent us, I think five of those little net gear jet packs and they worked uh, very well. And uh, we're still debating if we're going to switch from uh, Verizon to AT&T, but I just wanted to piggyback off of what you said there. Yeah, those Nighthawk jack packs, which I think are probably the same, you know, kind of yes. square with the, yeah, those things are pretty awesome. Yeah, they were great, they were easy, easy to configure. Yeah, yeah, assuming you have connectivity. I mean, connectivity is the ultimate question, but if you do, I haven't seen anything come close to those for just pure data usage. Yeah, this is a tough one because we have staff that are, um, that actually live over a six county area, including Virginia. And, it, you know, people will call up and go, what do you recommend? And I'm like, it depends on where you're physically at. Um, right. <laughs> and Scott, I live in Guilford County and, and I'll tell you, you know, I, I love having Spectrum, but I'll tell you two counties over, they hate it um, because they, they have no reliability to it. And, you know, it's really hard to sort of support staff because they're expecting us to know all that. And, right. you know, I don't have time to go through six, eight different devices because I don't have a house to go to in six or eight different counties to go figure it out. And if I'm having to figure out what an E is with somebody, I don't always have great testers to send them out with. <laughs> right. And it's, it's a shame that there's not like, you know, fiber isn't more common in our state. You know, I, it's funny too, because where I live in Winston-Salem, if I went literally um, like a half mile from where I live, there's fiber. Oh, so, wow. I mean, it's got to stop somewhere. I get that. But, you know, it's, it's just, and it's not like I live outside of town either. So, you know, it's just, it's funny how sort of randomly hit and miss the uh, spots of, of, things like fiber and just regular uh, copper internet connectivity are. Wow. So
so do we have any other i know aj spoke to it um aj were you getting ready to say something else I, I'm always getting ready to say something else. Go ahead, AJ. Go ahead, please. But I was I was just going to remark. I, I moved out of Raleigh about a year before Google Fiber got to where I was, and I was really irritated about that. <laughs> <laughs> but but you know you hear rumors of smaller. Uh, we've got I think ones being considered for Greenville, a smaller fiber company. There there are there are companies seeing those gaps in the market, but it's got to be worthwhile, and and that's the difficulty with a lot of services for rural communities in general is you got to have enough people to to have that return on investment or you have to subsidize the investment and we've already subsidized fiber for the country at one point and it didn't go as far as we wanted because it didn't ever get turned on so scott uh, roche mentioned green county they lived in green county they have fiber in a lot of the county now um which is ironic that you don't have in Winston-Salem. I mean, we don't have it in Greenville, uh, but they, uh, the cable company that's local to Greene County has overlaid much of the footprint with fiber. That is that in a lot of small towns that- That is so are. weird. Yeah. That is I, bizarre. I got it as a friend of mine and he, he bought it and then just started abandoning coax and overlaying much of it with fiber. We lived in Mari, which you guys, some of you guys might actually know where that is. Yeah, I know where that is. Um, and it didn't even have a stoplight. It was a flashing yellow light. I don't know that Mari has fiber. It was wireless at one point. Snow Hill has fiber. A lot of Snow Hill has fiber. Yeah. I mean, but it, even, even that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> my, my wife taught uh, middle school in Snow Hill. Yeah. A lot of small towns have been getting fiber from small phone companies and small cable companies. And uh, in the bigger cities, don't get it because I mean we still get fast internet from a cable company, but it would be nice to have some competition there with the fiber. So do you guys see an increase or a push for the broadband uh, initiative across the state? I'll be quiet. Shake your heads. <laughs> Nod your heads, please. Not as much as they don't know. <laughs> We say, I mean, Tammy. There should, a, there should be a bigger push than there is. There definitely needs to be a bigger push than there is. I mean, there's so many holes. Yeah, the the cable guys that approach me at Walmart really enjoy when I ask them those questions. But I'm sorry, what's your company doing for the uh, outer ranges of the uh, Guilford County? And um, how do you believe? You know, how do you feel about broadband? Um, apparently, there's something now on me that they don't bug me ever when I go to the store. <laughs> it works great. Anybody else is willing to use that? Be my guest. <laughs> I know Greenville is in the process. We're not, but there is a company that's that's eyeing us to possibly bring fiber to Greenville. They've had a couple of meetings with the, the community development department to bring in fiber to Greenville. So that'll be nice for those people that live close enough to get it. Nice. Yeah, what I would like to see come out of this uh, COVID mess with everybody having to stay home and try to work from home is I would like more pressure somehow to be put on Spectrum and different people like this to get away from these stuck points that we've run into so much over the years where we're not coming in your neighborhood because there's not enough houses per square mile to bring it and that kind of thing. I mean, we're going through a period now where they ought to be required if they're close enough to go in and, you know, offer this stuff, if it's right on the main road above a neighborhood or something, there ought to be some kind of push through legislation to make them make this available if there are enough people down in there willing to say, we'll sign up, you bring it down here. The thing that wrecked that was the state taking over all of the franchise agreements. When counties and cities had their own franchise agreements, they could and did require things like that. Pitt County used to require things like that out of Sudden Lake, our cable company. Uh, you, but you'd be surprised, speaking of that, you'd be surprised how many of your elected officials don't know that the state did that. Um, that's I've true, it's come been a while. With yeah, I mean, I've had ours come to me with complaints about Spectrum in our town wanting to see the franchise agreement. And I'm like, we don't have one. 
you know, and, and they were shocked to hear that. Yeah. yeah I think one I of think. the, I'm sorry, uh, one of the disheartening thing for me is Guilford County, um, you guys mentioned about having to go to a site for, to get internet, and they do that for students. They drive a bus out to a remote area, and that right. is how students get it. Mm -hmm. Two counties over, they have hotspots for every student. And I, and I totally get it's county money, it's this, that, there's a whole lot more to it. But that's really hard when my kid is talking to his friends and they're like, can we come to your house? Because we don't have internet. And I'm going to us, this is like, wow, like totally utility, this is normal. Um, for other people, it's not. And, and they rely on those types of things and it's, you know, it's, it's hard for me to kind of wrap my head around that, that, you know, there's these kids who literally their parents drive them or they walk in a lot of cases to a bus to sit on the ground to do homework. And my kid, you know, we got wireless all over our house and he could go sit out in the, you know, in the yard on the hammock. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know what can be done. You know, you guys said about running it to certain communities, but if those communities can't afford it, you know, how do you how do you justify it? So, you know, obviously, in my case, I work for county government, but I do have a high school student and he does have friends that do fall into a poverty area. So I don't know. What do you guys yeah, the, think? The real answer is for municipalities and county governments to become an ISP. Unfortunately, in North Carolina, our legislature has made that virtually impossible for us to do. Um, you know, some locations got grandfathered in. I think Greenville was one of them. No, no, Wilson. Yeah, but, yeah, you know, will. it's it's bad when the cable companies are writing the legislation and giving it to our representatives, and the representatives are taking that and, and, and passing the bill. What what leverage do we have at all, you know, to, to do what's right for our citizens when our legislature is taking that away from us and, and basically tying our hands. And then the cable companies have agreements with each other and they say, you can have this slice over here and we'll have this slice over here. I worked for the general assembly for 14 years prior, just doing all sorts of network management and everything else. And, you know, I was constantly hearing about statewide broadband and U.S. wide broadband and until you really get somebody to tie on and actually make that happen. And I think it's got to be state and even federal money really pushing that because, I mean, it, it, each one tries to bring it and it gets shot down just because there's, you know, they want to allocate the funds to something else. And you just, you're, you're never going to get that until somebody really brings it to the table. Well, and again, there's, there was federal funding for national fiber layouts and that fiber got run. Yeah. It's a lot of it's still dark. And so it's, it's not even necessarily a, a infrastructure problem at this point, other than bringing up, you know, the endpoint equipment to standard. It's not like fiber has a significant expiration date on it. No, yeah. That, that glass can hang out for a while, Tim somebody's got to tie into it and they've got to be willing to take that, that they also have to be allowed to tie into it yeah yeah you got to get the the right people pushing the right legislation so so let me ask this question how many of you or when are you all anticipating your staff going back to the office good question beth because when we talk about when we talk about all this internet and stuff I was in the director's office and I looked at her today and I went, so when are you thinking? And she went, oh my God, I can't even imagine. She said, I have no idea. And our county originally was talking January. And I was like, oh, hell no, not a chance. I will be sitting at my house. At least another our, year. Our numbers uh, are going the wrong direction um, mm. for anybody to come back, honestly. Yeah. Yeah, we were told January. We were to actually told um, December 31st, right, Darren? And um, so it was looking like January for Mecklenburg County, I think, right, Darren? Yeah, Mecklenburg's doing like a phased approach, um, bringing everybody back in phases. Phase one was scheduled to end December 31st with phase two starting after that. 
Um, our IT department is not technically slated until phase three. Um, so we could see, you know, middle of next year before IT is actually back in the building. I'll put it this way. Uh, they just ordered us headsets to use at home. So it'll be a while for you. <laughs> oh, God, that's funny. I'm that's sorry. That's what it's looking like. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We got it. We got it. We got an email. We got an email like maybe a month ago and from our boss and she was like, um, do you guys want headsets? And I was like, okay, so we're going to be working from home for the foreseeable future. <laughs> and, um, and then we got an email last week and they were like, oh, the headsets ordered, headsets that got ordered arrived and they ordered, they just went ahead and ordered one for everybody in our department. So, yeah. Giovanni said that Albemarle, Stanley County, they're back in full force and been that way since phase two. Is that all I'm staff? Cover, and I don't think that we don't have nearly as many people working from home because we can't. We so many people are doing public service, but the managers and administration and myself, we're all working mostly from home. I honestly think that that, that horse is out of the barn and it's not going back in. I've, I've got one lady who lives about a half an hour from work. Uh, she's our business manager. I don't think, I think she's planning to work, you know, two or three days a week permanently now from home. It just makes sense. I, I do it from home and I enjoy it. My boss, the library director is working from home. And um, I don't think that that's gonna necessarily for the people who can do it continuously gonna be something that reverts. Yeah, we've, we're in a similar spot. We've got several, even just in the IT department, several staff that are, you know, 45 minutes plus one way. You know, they disappeared in, in February and then they've just been loving life. Yeah, <laughs> I can't blame them. Yeah, our business manager lives out in Grifton, and she loves not having to make that drive into Greenville every morning to downtown. We run. Got, uh, go ahead, Kevin. We, we've got the we got the three of us crammed into a small office, so you know what we've been doing is just doing a rotation um, with an hour between. Um, the next person showing up to the office just so we're not coming in contact with each other. So we'll do a half day in the morning for a week, half day in the afternoon for a week, and then a week at home and just cycle through the three of us that way. Yeah. So from 180 staff, we have about 120 that work off site regularly, but they normally are required to come in at least one day a week, but they are completely 100% staggered. Um, if I'm not in the days that they're in, I could go six weeks without seeing certain people. Um, my partner and I, we swap off, um, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday. Um, I do an hour drive. So for me, that works out fabulously. I still have to do remote work. Um, but we have massive hardware because our hardware came from when they deployed our hardware came off of a shelf that was pulled from a hardware last year that was supposed to be replaced. Mm -hmm. So I spent a lot of time doing hardware repairs and that's not my job. Well, that's not actually part of my job. Now it currently is my job about uh, three quarters of my day. Wow. Giovanni wants to know, is he the only one, only agency that's back full time? He's not. I work for the, yeah, I work no, for the we're back full time, but we're we're very small here in Maiden. So we've we only spent probably about a month and a half rotating people in and out, doing stuff like that. But I mean, we're blessed to have some pretty good sized buildings for not that many people. So we're not all crammed in offices together and things like that. So we've um, we've been back full time for a long time. Yeah, same here. I'm with Town of Frenius. Uh, we close to the public, but we've been kind of rocking and rolling full time, right. especially with 911 and fire and everything. So, gotcha. IT for sure. Most of the other departments, finance, and I mean, like parks and all has been spread out, but most of the in town folks have been there for some time now, just kind of following the phase approach and just being safe where we can. So, we've, we've yeah, just our started kind of doing half and half sort of town board meetings and have. Some you know, we've been having that in person, so mm -hmm. just kind of coordinating all that. One of my biggest challenges, you know, in the beginning of all this, and we've kind of went back to having stuff on site again, too, for the council meetings and stuff, was the elected officials and getting them connected for their Zoom meetings and stuff like that. That was an extreme pleasure. I 
really don't want to do no more often than I have to. That is a whole nother session right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, therapy, we, we went so far involved have... for that. But yeah. let um, me know you're not alone on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've heard a lot about that. We had a TV set up where one of the board members would have been sitting so that his head could display just as big as his head was during the normal <laughs> town board, during the meeting. So, that, you know, if, if you're feeling the symptoms, you've got the signs, or even if you tested positive, you could still partake in the meetings. So, yeah, it's definitely been a fun experience. So Linda Schroeder said Wilson County IT never went home except for one office that had two people in a very small shared office and they rotated. Um, yeah. Tom, oh, go ahead, Stephen. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm actually from Reedsville. This is my first time attending. So um, hello, everyone. But anyway, um, I just wanted to say that uh, Reedsville didn't shut down either. I mean, they, they we have a lot of different buildings that are cl still closed to the public, but we were able to um, move around uh, to different buildings. Uh, like I'm at the rec center, or excuse me, I'm at the, um, our uh, senior center. And then we have another employee that's uh, IT guy that's at the rec center. And then our directors at city hall. So they, you know, IT has been separated, but we never uh, closed our doors other than to the public. So Thomas- Howdy neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas Sador, I, I don't know, I think I might have said your name wrong, Thomas, but he said the city of Raleigh, there's been no mention of a return to the office full time. My department has a schedule with assigned days, two per week. So if we want to come in, it must be those days unless we coordinate this change with someone. And Jim Coleman said we are mainly at home at infusion points. Since we are a cybersecurity company, we do have a team in our security operations center that's on site. We operate 24 by seven by 365. So we have a few in and out, no signs of everyone returning, at least not in the near future. City of Salisbury is back since phase two, but there is option of, for flexible work for each department. Um, and then Adrian said many virtual meetings and a small mileage reimbursement check for the past few months. <laughs> okay. Webcams, NDI uh, for our, for our council members. Yeah, the council members that can that can be a whole nother session right there. I, <laughs> I think when we first um, um, when this first happened, I think we saw a lot of traffic on the listserv about getting those council members into their meetings. And if we wanted to talk about teaching tech to non tech, we could have a whole session on that for just council <laughs> council members. Um, but I know one of the issues that we had was um, we had front desk people who had never connected from home. And that was a huge issue um, for us. So um, that was where a lot of our um, um, things came from. So I wanted to go back to, um, uh, we got about less than 10 minutes you know, about 10, 12 minutes left. Um, but I wanted to go back to um, one of the things that AJ had talked about at the beginning. He's talking about, he um, does a lot of technical writing and he's on the help desk. Is there anyone else from the help desk on the call who had some um, best practices or any things that you have done differently while supporting people while working remotely? Or even if you're not help desk, any other um, comments, questions? Um, best practices while assisting? I, th I think that consistency is important. So among your team, if you all call the same thing, the same thing, you can educate the user. So, you know, like the hamburger, a lot of people don't call it the hamburger, but if you tell somebody go click on the hamburger, they're going to look at you like you're crazy. But if you <laughs> educate and you, you know, as a team, you all say the hamburger are in a, a consistent with it, you know, it, it works out pretty well for their. Thank you, Ryan. I, I, I thought, thought you were making a really obscure then. analogy and then realized that you actually meant the three line menu. <laughs> <laughs> I want to echo, I think what Beth Ann was talking about earlier, just really putting yourself in the shoes of others who don't know the IT, they don't know the tech, even people within, you know, I've had applications folks that don't, that quite honestly, couldn't even turn the computer on. But, you know, putting yourself in their shoes and, and finding a way to dumb it down for everybody to, to understand has really kind of been critical and key for me. 
Steve Randone said before he left, he said, you treat um, your, your um, coworkers basically as your customer and look at, look at it as if you are a business and you want to keep their business. Yeah. Yeah. If you sell yourself well, they will keep coming back. And that's what you want as an IT folk. You know, we're, we're behind the scenes and in the dark a lot of times, but when things are getting done right, you do get some notice and, you know, they're definitely appreciative that you come to their level and help them out. Yeah, nobody wants to feel humiliated when they call to ask somebody for help, you know, because they don't know which E you're talking about, you know, and, and you know, we laugh or humiliate them or whatever, and or either or, or either we're condescending or sarcastic. Um, that doesn't help anybody, you know, your job is to help your users get connected, you know, not to make them feel small because they don't know what some of the terminology is. So yeah. back in the back in the days of dial up, um, I had to. This was before I knew anything about computers, and I had to dial up into ECU's um, internet, and I had to call because uh, I was having some issues. And I don't remember if the guy called me stupid or what I was doing stupid. <laughs> but the word the word stupid was used. No um, way. And I promised myself that if I was ever in his shoes, I would never call anyone stupid. And I remember that story anytime that I start to get ill with somebody that I'm supporting. Mm -hmm. And I just remember what it felt like to mm -hmm. be that person who's in a really fraught situation. You know, they need something. Mm -hmm. um, this is their living. This is, this is, you know, or their identity is tied up in this thing they do. And, and somebody's having fun um, <laughs> and um, and their paycheck is tied up in this thing they do and there's a lot on the on the on the ball for them right. and it's it's all based on whether I can help them or not right. so you know right. just uh, remembering all that and putting my like um, like uh, like the guy said you know put yourself in their shoes right I, I, we have a um, lady in our department and um, she was like recognized, like she received some huge award um, for what she does in our department. I work in actually park and rec department, but she is so, um, I, I should, I'm trying to find the right words for it. She's not very computer literate and she admits it openly. Um, but I'm assuming that people have um, either humiliated her or made her feel bad because she's always apologizing to me when she asked me for help. And she's like, I'm so yes. sorry to have to ask you. I'm so sorry to have to ask you for this. And I tell her, it's my job. Don't apologize to me for needing help. She's excellent at what she does. I mean, she, I could not do what she does. So it's not for me to humiliate her because she can't turn a computer on or doesn't know a whole lot about it. So we have to really keep that in our minds when we're teaching tech to non-techs. For us, at least for me, it's like, I get a few of those users when they call like, especially our city manager. She, she doesn't want to be on the the heavy caller list, which she really got to step her game up if she wants that list around here. But um, <laughs> for me, a lot of them, I get they, they are when they report to phishing and I'll, I'll call them to let them know, you know, because our users, and I'm glad they are, are scared to click anything. Right, right. Thank Yay! Goodness. <laughs> um, That's a good but thing. But it'll be legitimate. <laughs> like we got right, something Aaron? from a mental health place uh -huh. And it came out secured and they had to click it. And I, you know, I did my homework, found out what it was, actually contacted the user that sent it and let them know. It's like, if you're going to send something, you might want to call us because we don't click anything. Right. Um, yeah. But I'll follow up when I follow up the user. I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And my attitude is always like, no, please. I would rather get, you know, five or 10 false reports a day than go through what we had to when we had ransomware. Right. I mean, that right. was yep, 115 yes. overtime hours in five weeks. Right. My wife sent I, me this email. Can you confirm that? Absolutely. Right. Yeah, I was gonna say I agree with Callan. I get a fuck. We we just did a phishing campaign, um, and I actually originally worked on um on it and moved to a different department. And so now people will call me because they know I did. I ran through Orange County had a ransomware. You know, I've done all this. And so the person called me and she was like, "Oh my God, I didn't want to call you, but I just want to make sure everything's okay." And then when we, you know, I explained it to her, I went, "It's just phishing campaign. You know, this is what's happening." And she's like 
well, I feel so stupid. And I'm like, no, no, do not feel stupid. I want you to call me. I don't care. You can call me every day that you think there's a problem. You call me because I don't want to live through a hundred plus hour weeks for a month ever again in my life. <laughs> right? But no, you go ahead and call me. I'm perfectly fine with that. And AJ just commented the funniest one that we get all the time. And I say our users are scared. We use no before. We do quarterly training. They have to do, I think it's like three videos a quarter. And if they fail the phishing campaign, if they click when they're not supposed to, they get enrolled in a class too. So that might be why they're really afraid to click. But so we'll yep. send out, they'll, they'll get the notification that they have training to do and they'll report that as phishing. Yeah. <laughs> I've had that happen. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. We've had that happen too. I will say we use um, no before also. And so I really, really love it. Um, and, and I actually helped set it up. But last week, I um, one of the things you can do with no before for the phishing is you can send an email saying that your um, order got canceled at Amazon. I almost got nailed because I just placed a freaking order at Amazon <laughs> for equipment. And the person and it the person who did the trick, you know, did the who actually does the fishing, I had to call her. She's one of my best friends. And I go, I gotta tell you, you did a really good kick-ass job on this because I swear to God, I almost kicked clicked on this myself. And I said, that's what we want to see. That's how you do this job. I said, and that's how we teach our people not to click on crap. And she go, Did you did you click on? And I went, No, because I came to my desk and actually looked at it before I clicked on it on my phone. And so my, but, it, but it was one of those moments. My boss came to us the day before that one of our one of our emails came out and was like, y'all better not click. Because <laughs> he said, the last thing I want to do is see one of y'all's names on the report. Oh, that was cool. Okay, there. no, see, that, that defeats the purpose, though. <laughs> so that totally defeats the purpose if IT <laughs> has the heads up on that one. We never told anybody. It was two people in... Uh, 1600 people that knew when those guys went out and if you got nailed you already well you got a lecture from me but we didn't give anybody a heads up on those because that's you know that's the whole point of it is to find out who's clicking on it when oh, i know i know before you, you know you get like the first thing that is an assessment to see how many people click well it went to everybody somebody in our administration department was like oh no and forwarded it back out to everyone else and said, this is spam, this is phishing, don't click this. And so I went back to the person, the customer success manager, whatever, and know before, and I was like, so this would happen. She's like, hey, I guess we need to wait a month and run another one and go ahead and tell that person before you do it so they don't do this again. Because it ruined the whole thing where no one clicked anything. And I know that people are going to click by nature. Darren Smith, did you have something you wanted to um, comment? Okay. Except right. they want uh, stories about horrible users that uh, <laughs> I can tell them a few about you. <laughs> <laughs> Darren, Ouch. we're not, not going to ruin my reputation right about now. We're going to end. <laughs> end we're going to end the meeting at this point. <laughs> So we have about two more minutes left on this. And um, just to sum it up, we noticed that our topic was teaching text to text, but we really got into a whole lot of other stuff, um, connectivity, bandwidth, all that fun stuff, um, because it's more than that. It's more than just teaching. Um, it, it could be, it could expand. Um, um, it's bigger than that. That's all, basically what I wanted to say. Anybody have any final thoughts before we end our session? I don't want you to get caught in a... Um, I said this in another session yesterday, but mm -hmm. the, the, the no before phishing things, I've had people forward them back to me and say, hey, I got this. I don't tell them it's no before. I don't tell them it's part of training because I don't want them to ever think that something is low risk. I just say, yeah, that looks like that looks like phishing. Thank you for forwarding it to me and just leave it at that. That's, That's what we had idea. to do at first. Um, because before we instituted that fish alert button from no before, we would, that's the only time we got heads up from our people to let us know that, yes, you're going to get a heavy influx of emails starting tomorrow because we're starting a new campaign um, because our users were great and they would send them to the help desk just like they're supposed to and let us know. But that fish alert button from no before, that's been a lifesaver for the help desk. Okay. Since it does, you know, yeah. if you click it and it says, you know, congratulations, this was a simulated phishing attack or whatever brought on by your brought by your organization so they're starting to understand that some of them are tests 
But like I said, if you click it and you get enrolled in another 15 minute course, you kind of stop clicking real fast. Yeah. My rep sent me the info to add the button and I haven't done it. It sounds like I really need to. It, it's, by, it's, 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 by the way, they do have a mobile um, button also and Orange County was going to implement it until I flipped departments and then they sort of petered off on it but we've actually discussed putting it on all of our mobile devices so that you had that option right there all right you guys it is um 445 and I just got a notification that we're getting ready to end the session Beth and AJ I can't I'm not going to start naming people Thank you all so much for joining in and um, for a great conversation today. And I hope that we will see everybody at 545 for our virtual party. See yeah, y'all later. Was <laughs> this is way what I needed this afternoon. Thank you. Great, Bethan. Thank you. Y'all have a great time. Have a great afternoon. See you. We had a bit. session. It was good.